Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Fred R. Klein. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here, Lorraine. You're a bit of a legendary figure in Santa Fe. You've had an art gallery in Santa Fe for years. You're an art historian, a writer, a poet, a private art dealer. You also were a writer for National Geographic years ago. Yes, indeed. But we're here to celebrate your brand new book called Leonardo's Holy Child. And can you say the whole subtitle? Can I say the whole subtitle? Subtitle, yes. Uh, I can't read it from okay, here. Okay, I will. Uh, the discovery of a Leonardo da Vinci masterpiece, a connoisseur's search for lost art in America. Yes. You are a treasure hunter, and you found this amazing treasure. You're called an art explorer, and, and you're known for your discoveries of old masters and 19th and 20th century artists. What is an art explorer? An art explorer is someone who looks for lost art. Uh, and it's not in a jungle. It's in shops, flea markets everywhere, uh, in co private collections. And it's usually works that are not signed. So they're unknown. So that's why they're lost. So I'm out to find them. And I'm looking for masterpieces, which is like, good luck, Pilgrim, you know? Yeah, yeah. But you say you bring a sleuth-like eye. There's a whole element of, of detective work and investigation as you find these things. So you find a lost masterpiece, but then you have to prove that it is what you say it is, don't you? So there's Indeed. a whole documentation Indeed. aspect. It's, it's very much like... Um, being a theoretical art historian, because I first have to come up with the idea that it could be something. Then I experiment a little bit with it. I come up with a hypothesis. Then I have to prove it and develop the theory with evidence. So it's very scientific as well as aesthetic. Well, yeah, you say it's really a balance between the science and the art. Yes. Um, so. What is connoisseurship? What, what is the word connoisseur? We think of a wine connoisseur. It's I know. Not, what does it mean in, in the terms of art? It's an ill-used term. I think it's a wonderful term, but it's not used that much. It, it tends to have a pompous connotation. Yeah. And to call yourself, well, I'm a connoisseur, you know. Yeah. Like, wow. Uh, but uh, it's basically a, a focus on quality. Number one, you have to be able to recognize quality. And once you do that with, say, a given painting, uh, then you have to start investigating. And well, you, you, it could be this, it could be that. You don't know everything about art. You know, there's thousands of artists and tens of thousands of paintings out there. So I have to determine in, in working with a painting what period it came from, what, who are the likely artists. I know that it's well done. And then I start looking. And connoisseurship is the refinement of this quality. It's where I look for comparative details. Comparative details, signature comparative details that I can relate from a painting by Raphael to this painting I'm looking at a drawing by Leonardo that is established to the drawing I might have. And it, that's the way it's done. It's, it's a, you compare signature details from the nose to the eyes, to the ears, to the mouth, to the head, to the subject matter that you're dealing with. Is, could it relate to the artist? All these things come into play. Plus, you had better be better educated about art more and more and more because it's never ending. You describe it as evidence-based investigation, but intuition is a, a large part of it and imagination is a large part of it. But, and you go to 
flea markets and auctions and estate sales and stuff and, and always on the lookout. How you We're going to talk about the Leonardo drawing that you found. And no new Leonardo's has surfaced in over 100 years, and he painted 500 years ago. But it's yeah. been 100 years since somebody discovered a, a drawing. A drawing. Yeah. So tell us how this happened, please. <laughs> it's totally amazing. Uh, I received a catalog in the mail from Christie's. This is back in 2000. And uh, it was a mixed sale, drawings, paintings, even frames. And just flipping through, I think it was on the second or third page, I saw this black and white photo of a, of a child. It was about this big. Wow. This big. Uh -huh. But it was clear. It was a sharp photo, and I said, whoa, this is amazing. I love this. You know, this is a master's hand for sure. And then I started thinking about it, and pretty soon I said, could this, could this be Leonardo? Because I had just looked in a, in a book on Leonardo's early years and seen his first two paintings from the 1470s. Two Madonna and child paintings, the Madonna of the Carnation and uh, the Benoit Madonna, so -called. And we'll look at those in a minute, but first yes. I'd so, like you to show them so this the is child. A, this is what the child looks like, blown up about four times. But it's true in its red chalk nature, and uh, it was something that I immediately blew up after I received the drawing, but that comes a little later. But it was what I worked from. This was the photo that I worked from. So this was the matrix. Mm. And uh, all the clues that I found developed from that. But so here comes the catalog in the mail, and I think, could this be Leonardo? My God. And it was, it's the wildest dream, you know, to, to find something, anything by Leonardo painting or a drawing is like the holy grail of art, and certainly of connoisseurship, certainly of, of being an art explorer. It's like climbing Mount Everest, you know, or more than that, because lots of people have done that, right? <laughs> and so this was, however, in the catalog attributed to another artist. Indeed. So that's the plot thickens. It was attributed to... Um, Anibala Caracci, who was a great Italian artist, circa 1580 to 16 something, very great artist. But I knew it was wrong because I knew Caracci's work and I had a drawing by him. And the cataloger was mistaken because the drawing is inscribed right here with this name. Okay, and it looks like it could be Barocci or Caracci if you're looking closely because there's this little C there. So the catalog read it as Caracci. Why, I don't know why she misinterpreted the B. And um, I knew it wasn't Barocci Baro 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 <laughs> either. Um, and he was also a very great artist maybe more so than, than Karachi. Um, and I knew his drawings as well, and I knew it wasn't Barocci, and I knew it wasn't Karachi. So who then? They had made a mistake. And not only that, so here it is mistaken in the catalog, estimated at 1000 to $2,000. That means that it could have sold for a reserve of $500. So I'm, I'm literally jumping up and down in my mind and um, wrestling with this idea. Then I go to this book and I find the correlation with these two earliest paintings. Is it time to show them that? Yeah, cool. Okay, That's this fine. is the Madonna of the Carnation. This is a close up. It's a mother and child. This of, is a, of infant Jesus. Yes. And looking at a flower. Yeah, and we see the similarities in the beautiful rendition of this child's head. So I saw that right away. And then there's another early painting from the 1470s that uh, 
also has infant Jesus in it, and it's just as close. It's not that one. Oh, okay. But it's 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 another painting. It's in the Hermitage in in, uh -huh. in Russia. Uh, so, so let's do this one while we're is it okay? Yeah. That's fine. Because that's fine. So I coordinated those two early paintings. Uh huh. And um, I'm I'm still looking, you know, to find evidence because that's not going to be enough. I know for the the so-called. Uh, priesthood of Leonardo, the art historians and museums and universities, you know, that are the uh, cabal of Leonardo. So I know it's not going to be enough, so I keep looking for evidence, and totally by accident, and in Collected Works Bookstore, which was right across the street from my gallery, I'm looking through books, and I'm, I'm hoping, you know, could I find something from Florence of the 1470s, which is where I wanted to be. And here's this book, Florence from the 1470s. It was an exhibition in London. And I opened the book, and here's my baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't believe it. I said, this is the same child, you know? This is, this is the same child. So and I had to buy the book, of course. In great excitement, I took it across the street where the drawing was in my gallery, and as if I were the father, I knew it was the same infant, and that was wonderful. That so was, you had to do, was, uh, the, the level of research that you did was really impressive to me, and I want to tell you, in your book, it reads like a detective story. It's a really good read. So you had to test the paper it was on. You had to t find out when he started using All this, this red. Exactly. Tell me about that. Well, I that. first had to buy it. Yes, it's true. <laughs> if you don't mind, I could retrace a little bit there. Because, Very little bit there. Yes. I. It was. Uh, so I, I decided to bid $3,500 for it. And uh, thinking, well, I needed a biblical hex to win this because I had bid on other things and lost. I bid uh, $8,000 once on a Dutch drawing that I thought was uh, was Peter Bruegel, the elder, the great Flemish artist, a drawing. And it was it was estimated at uh, like two to 3,000. So I bid 8,500 for it at a Sotheby's auction. It sold for $400,000. Ooh. So I missed it. Yeah. I had a walk-in part. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And so that, you know, I was uh, skeptical. I may or may not win it, but we won it. We won it. And um, so it arrives in Santa Fe, and I start examining it. But the first thing that has to be done is to determine that the paper is correct. Mm -hmm. And from my experience, I could tell that it was but I needed a more expert eye to affirm it. Plus, I needed to take the backing off of the drawing because it had three, three backings that had been put on over the years, so they had to be taken off so I could see what was on the back. Maybe a drawing, maybe an inscription, some clue. So I sent it to the Metropolitan Museum to Marjorie Shelley, who's the head conservator there of paper, world-renowned paper conservator. She took the back off, nothing there. And I asked Marjorie, I said, uh, could this be from the 1470s? She says, there's nothing about it that says it couldn't, mm. Mm. which was wonderful because she's worked on Leonardo drawings. They have a couple of them in the Met, which I actually have examined firsthand. So, so we're... Speaking today with Fred R. Klein about his treasure that he found, the drawing of Leonardo's Holy Holy Child, uh, it you've spent in effect then 15 years. It's been 15 years since you first had it, yes. and you've been presenting more and more of the paper, the red color, all these different things that you had to verify in proof of right. the fact that it was Leonardo. When was it finally accepted as Leonardo, and and what happened to it? Well, I still own it, and Good. I intend to exhibit it. And I presented my theory of the drawing with all the evidence in the book. So, in effect, there it is. And the art world is 
now going to comment on it. They've never seen it. A few people have seen it and encouraged me. But this is my theory that I now present as if I'm a pseudo-Einstein presenting the theory of relativity for the first time, which he did without getting approval. But So anyway, this is, this is it. And I felt like I had become a specialist in Leonardo. So now I'm, I'm talking, you know, from the pulpit, one of the many pulpits for Leonardo. So I, I, I found the evidence, which little by little by little added up to a huge yes. Yeah. Not yeah. only did I coordinate my child with, with uh, three, other, three other drawings, one in the Uffizi, one in the, in, in the Louvre, which is another, a longer, more, much more interesting story about that particular and drawing. And it's in here? So yes, it is, it is yes. in there. And on and on. I found a watermark on the back of, this, of my drawing mm -hmm. once it was, the back was taken off. I found evidence of, of a sepia ink framing around the drawing, which was almost cut off. And I found an article by a Leonardo scholar that said Leonardo usually drew sepia ink around his ah. drawings. Uh, what else? Well, there was the telltale mole. Yes, the we mole. We haven't even gotten to no, that, have we? No, the mole. <laughs> yes. So, so it was amazing. You know, there was the telltale mole that I found. First of all, I didn't see it on here. Because then I of saw the angle of the head. Because of the angle of the uh -huh. head, and it's been... It's been lessened with some white chalk on here. But it was in the Uffizi baby. Yeah. And yeah. I said, if the Uffizi baby has it, and this is the same baby, this baby has to have it too. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, there it was. With a little magnification, you can see that it's been covered over with white chalk. And then I found it again in, in um, a red chalk drawing by Leonardo that was dated much later. Mm and was not considered his first red chalk drawing as this is now. This is his first red chalk mm. drawing. And he is credited with inventing red chalk. So, you know, why wouldn't Leonardo throw together some red powder, some ochre, put a little fixative in it, and make a yeah. piece of chalk? Yeah. And uh, that's what he did. And it became his favorite medium. So let's look at the oeuvre of, <laughs> yes. of Leonardo. So there's 4,000 uh, drawings and paintings. Is that about right? You're the expert. In all his codices, yeah, uh -huh. yes. All yeah. his notebooks put together. But there are only 70. 70 odd preparatory drawings. And this is one of them. This is one of them. So for 500 years, this has been unidentified or lost. And then. Nothing new about Leonardo has come up for a hundred years, and suddenly, not suddenly, but through long work and detective work, you find this. And we don't know where it came from. Christie's had it in the auction with no provenance whatsoever. Usually they put private collection, you know, to finesse the idea of, of naming who owned it, because that's the right of the seller. It's privacy. Nothing not even private collection. So I said, well, God, mm. this is a mystery. So I get in touch with Christie's, as I have over the years, again and again and again. Where did it come from? I'm sorry we can't tell you. Mm. I'm sorry we can't tell you. Well, maybe now they will, because the mystery deepens. Yeah, because it's now such that an I exciting development it, in the art world. Now that I've published it. Yeah. And, um, and, the, you see, the Leonardo faction, the, the cabal, I call it, or the priesthood, the academic and institutional art historians who have written this and that and this and that on Leonardo, but never discovered anything except some footnote facts. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. a good one, you know, like the, the brown ink around the yeah. drawing and, and um, a, a number of other things. But so... It's, it's a bit of a revolutionary uh, publication of this in this way. It's my, my paper on Leonardo with all the evidence. Here it is. And that's what's so exciting about this book, and it just came out. Yes. I know that you're going to be appearing in a 
of and, and talking about this. Well, one thing that really struck a chord with me, uh, you had written, you've written for the New York Times, you found, we'll talk about some of your other treasures you found, but the New York Times article was called, You Never Know, An Ongoing Search for Lost Art in America. And what we want to encourage people is to educate yourself so that you have some idea about what you might find, but to just go out and allow your what knowledge you have and your instinct and intuition to perceive perhaps another life for this object that is just sitting here. You start this book with some really stimulating epigrams, and some of them are two of my favorite quotes, Albert Einstein's imagination is more important than knowledge. But this is where the prepared mind falls. This is a quote from Louis Pasteur, where observation is concerned, chance favors only the prepared mind. So you have saturated yourself in these studies. Of course. And just you're leafing through a catalog, of chance, and your prepared mind thinks, sees this image and thinks, aha. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Right. So I spend a lot of time studying. I know, I know. but And looking at pictures. Yes. And going to museums and looking at pictures and books because you can't get to all the museums. It's impossible. So art books are wonderful. They're, they're portable museums. And I have a house full, you know, a, a, a large library, which I'm constantly looking at. And you have to keep refreshing your memory. And it's best to focus on the masters, not the peripheral people, because they usually copied the masters. You find the master, you study his complete body of work, and then you can see his influence on other people and tell his original hand if you keep at it. Another quote that just delighted me, because it's, it's a quote by Picasso, that says, for me, a picture is neither an end or an achievement, but rather a lucky chance, an art experience. I try to represent what I have found, not what I am seeking. And here's like the motto for treasure hunting such exactly. as you. I do not seek, I find. Well, I have identified with Picasso for a long time. In fact, met him once on the French Riviera in 1964. Hello, hello. <laughs> and he was driving out of his estate above Cannes with his famous German art dealer, Mr. Kahnweiler, in this black limo. I'm sure it was Kahnweiler's. Uh, and I had been waiting at his gate and brought gifts. And the gatekeeper said, you're most welcome. I'm sure Picasso would love to see you. And I'm handing the gatekeeper some 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 money actually some kennedy half dollars which had just come out in every, all the rage and nobody had them so i had about mm -hmm. ten dollars worth gave it to the gatekeeper i gave him a poem i had written for picasso oh he'll be so excited anyway he got busy and he left so we're standing around and i said well how can i he said come back tomorrow so we came back tomorrow he said oh he's at the beach in con so we drove down to the beach in Cannes, and there he was. <laughs> there he was with, with an older woman sitting on the beach, drawing in the sand. Oh. And I stood about, I didn't want to bother him, and I stood about uh, 40, 40 yards away with a rather poor camera. And surreptitiously, I click, 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 didn't turn into much. So then he leaves. So. When he's gone, I go over to where he was, and there's this drawing in the sand, and it's a devil's face, which, by the way, was painted on his driveway up to his estate. You can't very well steal it unless no, you dig up the asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> so here was the face in the sand, and here comes the tide. We Before I can even take a picture oh, of wow. it. Oh, wow, wow. Talk That's, about talk about poetic justice, right? But that is part of the evanescent, vanishing nature of art. And and here this wonderful Leonardo had vanished for lo these five hundred years yes. and you uh, retrieved it. Uh, tell me we just have a minute left. Um, there are people who will be inspired by this and when you read it it's such a good detective story, people will wonder, what would be your advice? to people, I know you can't tell them how to do this, yes. but a little bit of a guidance, a thought 
to think as they go out into the world. Yes. Like, you, like the New York Times says, you never know where this will turn up. What, what, what right. should they look for? All right. How about keeping an attitude of serendipity? Anything can happen. Expect it. Expect to be lucky. But be sure you educate yourself first. How's that? That's good. That's good. Um, An attitude of serendipity. Well, and I will tell you that they, this is such a beautiful book. This is the new book, Leonardo's Holy Child. It has color plates in it. It has black and whites. It's beautifully illustrated, beautifully done. So I consider my, it very serendipitous for me to find your book. And I, to have found you. This has been a wonderful conversation with you. It's and really, I think really that the good. art world, as this book gets out, there'll be more and more people who want to find out how step by step. Just two of the other ones, we can't, you found a, a portrait of John Marshall, the great jurist. Yes. And then there was uh, the Eastern European person, uh, Brecht, Brecht. A Coke. Yeah, okay. That yes. was a, a drawing I kicked over in a, in a junk shop ah. and sold to Eugene Thaw and it's now in the Morgan Library. It took me a year to identify it. And I found two Jan Bruegel paintings that are now in the catalog resume, both accidentally, with serendipity, with the metaphysics of chance, as I exaltingly call it. I love it. I love it. And where, where was the least likely place you ever found one of these treasures? I think kicking over this, dr this dusty drawing in the old... Uh, junk shop, the yeah. free market shop. <laughs> Hold it up. It said $60 on it. And I looked at the owner. And I said, $60? She said, you can have it for 50 And, and it, what turned was into, it? It, it turned into the Coke drawing that's in the Morgan Library and a stipend for a year's sabbatical. Oh, my. Well done. Well done. Well, I'd like to thank you. Our guest You're is quite Fred R. Klein, author of this beautiful Leonardo's Holy Child. I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today. I want you to go out with serendipity in mind and make your own discoveries. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.